Hello and welcome to Oya's Daughters, Connecting Black African Fed Feminisms Around the World. My name is Alana Francis de Govaya, and I'm the Director of Programs at the Africa Center in Harlem, in New York City. We are so thrilled that you are joining us today for this very special program that we have worked on in partnership with the incredible writer, feminist theorist, researcher, and author, Nina Salami. Nina is the co-director of the Feminist Movement Activate and a feminist theorist and research senior researcher at Perspectiva. At the Africa Center, we are re radically reimagining the stories and structures shaping the lives of all people of African descent around the world. Our work is focused on deepening connections with the African continent and finding unity within the global Black, Black and African diaspora. And that's why we are so excited about partnering with Mina for Women's History Month and the conversation today. Mina will be joined by Black African feminist thinkers and activists from Ethiopia, Nigeria, Brazil, Barbados, the United Kingdom, and the United States. I hope you enjoy what promises to be a dynamic and thought-provoking discussion. Please make sure to follow Mina and all of the speakers to keep updated and support their very important work. You can also keep in touch with us with us at the Africa Center by following us at the Africa Center. And with that, I will hand it over to Mina. Thank you, Alana. And hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so my name is Mina Salami and I am the moderator of this event, which is titled Oya's Daughters, Connecting Black African feminisms around the world. And I've curated this event in partnership with the Africa Center and I'm really thrilled to be here and to, we're going to hear from some incredible speakers. Um, as Alana said, we have brilliant women from Ethiopia, Barbados, Brazil, Nigeria, the UK and the US joining us today. And the point is really to bring the diversity of Black African feminisms to the fore um, and to connect us across the diaspora, cross regionally, um, to build solidarity really, because that's something that we direly need in these times. Um, and it is also the point that we can, we can share knowledge with each other and with all of you who have joined us today. Um, because as Erika Badu says, if your knowledge were your wealth, then it would be well earned. And I think that that's a, a really good, good sentiment to start with. Um, so I'm gonna introduce each of the, the six speakers that are with us today, um, starting with Nabila Abdul-Malik, who is a Pan-African and feminist storyteller and curator who uses the creative arts to speak her piece and archive stories of daily existence. Born and bred in Addis Ababa, she has since crisscrossed the earth, but found her way home again. Nabila is a photographer, poet, writer, and editor. She's currently working to complete her first poetry anthology titled, May We Be Among Tomorrow. Our second speaker is Olutimane Adegbeye, who is the Nigerian queer feminist writer and speaker whose work focuses on human rights, inclusion, and social justice in the areas of gender, sexualities, and urbanization. Timain has addressed audiences in over a dozen countries, and she has worked with a variety of corporate and civil society organizations, both locally and internationally. Her work has been translated into multiple languages with selected publications incorporated into academic curricula and in, um, in various countries. Thirdly, we are joined by Dr. Tonya Haynes, who is a lecturer, interim head, and coordinator of graduate programs at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Mita Barrow Unit in Barbados. Tonya is the first graduate of the PhD program of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, and she is proudly representing a new generation of homegrown Caribbean feminist scholars. Animated by the liberatory potential of Caribbean feminisms, she has published essays on Caribbean feminisms and 
feminist thought in numerous journals. She's co-editor of the special issue of The Scholar and Feminist Online, entitled Caribbean Feminisms, Interventions in Scholarship, Art, and Activism Across the Region. And then we have Aja Monet, who is a surrealist blues poet, a storyteller and organizer, who was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Aja won the legendary New Yorkian Poets Cafe Grand Slam Poetry Award title in 2007. And she follows in the long legacy and tradition of poets participating and assembling in social movements. Her first full collection of poems is titled, My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter. Her poems explore gender, race, migration, and spirituality. Aja Monet co-founded a political home for artists and organizers called Smoke Signals Studio. And she's currently working on her next full collection of poems titled Florida Water. She also serves as the new artistic creative director for V-Day, which is a global move movement to end violence against all women and girls. Jamila Ribeiro, our fifth speaker, has a master's degree in political philosophy from the Federal University of Sao Paulo. She's the coordinator of the Sueli Carneiro Editorial Seal and the Plural Feminisms Collection, an independent editorial initiative that changed the publishing market in Brazil. Jamila is the author of several books and she is a professor in the journalism department at the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo. She's a columnist for Folia de Sao Paulo's newspaper and she was a deputy assistant of human rights for the city of Sao Paulo in 2016. She was awarded the 2019 Prince Klaus Award granted by the Kingdom of the Netherlands and she's considered by the BBC to be one of the 100 most influential women in the world that same year. Last but not least, we are joined by Shardine Taylor Stone, who is a writer, activist, educator, and trade unionist. She's vice chair of the Musicians Union Equalities Committee, an elected, an elected member of the London Regional Committee, in 2017, she won the British LGBT Award for contribution to LGBTQI life and is now currently writing her first book on the neoliberalization of black feminism, as well as studying a master's in law. She plays drums in the black feminist punk band, Big Joni, and she's a newly appointed trustee of London Black Women's Project which is a specialist and dedicated organization for Black, Asian, and minority ethnic women and girls who have experienced violence and abuse. Thank you so much for joining me, all of you. Um, so the first question that I want to ask you all has to do with the title of this event, which is Oya's Daughters. So the Yoruba goddess Oya She's revered in all parts of the Black Atlantic, from Nigeria to Brazil, to Cuba, to the UK and the US. She's the goddess of the winds of thunder and transformation. And she's worshiped and evoked whenever social change is either manifested or desired. You could say that she's a feminist god and she offers a symbolical and political language through which we can explore um, vital and critical ways of social change. So I would like to invite each of our speakers to share an object that represents Oya to you. And I would also like you to tell us what that particular object means to you, and particularly in the con context of your per personal feminist journey, as well as your journey as a Black feminist of African heritage. And if you can also share what the object represents to you when it comes to political sisterhood and to connecting Black African feminisms around the world. So I've asked each speaker to, to prepare or to bring something in preparation for this event. Um, 
And I would like to urge all of you who are participating um, as you listen to the speakers um, to think about what object or what kind of uh, symbolic or archetypal or spiritual or political um, object or message uh, you might have shared in, in this panel. And please feel free to, to share in the chat um, if there is a particular object you would have brought. Um, also feel free to just generally um, chat in, in the chat box, um, whether you're watching on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube, you can, you can um, speak to each other in the chat and you can also address questions to all of the speakers or to individual speakers. Um, just before we respond to this first question, I want to emphasize that, you know, this is a, 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 a Black feminist conversation, which means that there are, uh, there are many topics that, that fall under the remit of feminist movement and feminist struggle that can feel um, triggering or painful or just difficult and challenging. Um, and so, you know, I just want to prepare everyone who's here in case there's anything that feels sensitive to you as the conversation unfolds. Um, but I can also assure you that it is going to be a conversation that will feel hopeful and, and nourishing at the same time. So um, let's start with you, Shardine. Um, what object have you brought? And um, could you just share your thoughts on this question? Thank you for that lovely introduction, and it's such an honor to, and a privilege to be on this panel with such amazing, incredible women, and those introductions have made me nervous. So, <laughs> thank you so much. So, um, the object that I started, well, wanted to talk about was this one here. Hopefully you can see that. Um, Could you hold it a little bit closer to the... Closer? So we can see the text. Um, it says, do you remember Olive Morris? Great. That's the one, yeah. So um, this was a sort of anthology that was put together by the Remembering Olive Morris Collective. Um, but I picked it because um, it was given to me as a gift. And but also I think it represents to me the kind of um, heart of black feminism in the UK. So for those that are unfamiliar with Olive Morris, um, she was born in Jamaica, she came to um, Britain when she was very young. And um, she started off in the Black British Panther Party movement, and then started the um, Black Feminist um, organisation um, called OAD, which was an organisation of women of African and Asian descent. And um, she did lots of amazing things and she passed away um, very young at the age of 27 after having achieved and done so much of which the sort of legacy is still there. So um, when I received the brief about um, Oya and thinking about someone or an object or thing or what have you about um, transformation, she was the first um, person that came up into my mind um, for what kind of inspired me to make, I guess, that journey from just your sort of usual sort of feminism that we have to go through the school curriculum. And I don't know what it's like anywhere else, but in the UK, it's very white. It's very sort of middle class, it's very liberal. And you have to go through like these layers to get through to a sort of black feminist voice. And then when you do find that voice, it's often an American one. So then you need to go through more layers and more layers um, to try and find a voice that, um, you know, you, you can sort of hear and, and connect with, not just um, as, as a black woman, but also just like a, imagining um, someone like Olive Morris sort of in your, air, in your area. So I live in Brixton and um, Olive Morris um, actually squatted a building two doors down from where I actually live. And um, so even when I'm sort of walking this area, it's like her spirit is there. And sometimes it's, I feel like I just need to go for a walk and just sort of try and connect into um, some of this sort of like amazing sort of black feminist activism that was like on the bottom of my road and um, just kind of pick that up and bring myself back together again and sort of do the work that I want to do. But um, in terms of the personal journey, it was finding out through her and um, some of the work that she did was what inspired me to sort of do some of the work that I do 
here now. So she was also quite involved in the left in um, the UK, which I am, which is through the trade union movement. And um, also um, she did things like put on, putting on a conference, um, which I did a sort of mirrored version um, a few years ago in the same building where she did her first one. Because for me, that sort of ancestral thing of trying to connect with that energy of people who've gone before is actually really important in my work. Um, Cause I often feel that we, we don't do that enough. And um, yeah, so that's why I wanted to bring that object in um, today. And um, also we're both Cancerians. So <laughs> um, we share the same star sign. So it, it's just all these sort of little connections. I think her birthday is like two days after mine or something ridiculous like that. So um, just like as an icon and a figure, she's extremely important to me. And um, her politics as well, particularly. Um, she was an internationalist. She went to China in the 70s. You can imagine a young black woman going to China because she really believed in a kind of international um, class struggle. And um, that's something that I am really believing as well. So just seeing another black woman have that kind of very open and very sort of strong sort of belief in actual a kind of revolutionary politics um, is something that I try to sort of embody in my work and what I do every day. Thank you so much, Shardine. Um, that's great to actually start off with, how do I put it? Um, just getting some sort of ancestral energy and spirit into this conversation. I really love that um, because I agree with what you said, like, you know, in terms of it is so important that we continue to uh, not only to honor the, the ancestral black feminist lineages, but also to engage um, with the, the, the work that they left behind so with their legacy, basically. And so that's a great um, looking book. I don't have it, but I'm going to get it and hopefully others will too. Do you, would her, um, you, know, you mentioned that she, she was an internationalist as well as a leftist and a feminist. Um, do you feel that that part of her legacy has sort of encouraged you to think of your, your feminism, your black feminism as something that is both local and international at the same time? No, absolutely. I mean, that's something that I'm always striving to do. So this is why this is quite an exciting event for me, because um, I guess I'll talk about it more in the second part. But like, you know, we have so much sort of opportunity to connect online, but actually there is something about, you know, going somewhere and actually seeing and working with people and actually learning you know, Audrey Lord famously came over to Europe and did a lot of work in Germany. So actually do, having that sort of physical presence, I think is really important. Thank you so much. Um, Olive Morris is certainly a woman we should all bear in spirit. Um, Nabila, can we move on to you? What, um, what object have you brought with you? Sure, Mina. Um, so I have a camera. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this camera? Yes, we can see um, Yeah. So as you can tell, it's a very old school camera. Um, it, it used to belong to my mom and dad. Um, and I chose it for a number of reasons. Um, not only because I'm interested in photography, but I think because I'm really interested in memory and archiving. Um, and documenting and immortalizing moments. Um, and I think a camera does that, not that it's the only way to do it, but a camera kind of freezes moments. Um, you know, we look back at images from the 50s, the 60s, um, and it's incredible because it's almost like we're transported to those places and we're given remnants of that moment um, and of moments. And I think the camera is a really powerful tool for that. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of our movement, I think it's equally important, just as Chardine was saying, to understand, you know, the people that came before us, to understand our her stories, to understand that we're not the first, you know, there's really nothing new that's been said or been done, um, that we're building on the work of so many of our, our mothers and our grandmothers and our, you know, those who came before us. So, if we have a better understanding of our her stories, and I think you know we're we're much more grounded in 
the present and then we're able to move forward. Um, but also because it's something that's been inherited, because it's something that used to belong to a previous generation, this camera, I, it, it also reminds me that we inherit a lot of things, good and bad. And, you know, what do we do with what we inherit? Um, what do we honor? What do we treasure? What do we discard? What do we replace? Um, what cycles do we break? Um, what cycles do we keep? So, you know, this idea of also tradition, creating tradition as well as replicating tradition, um, the stories that we were told that we pass down or we don't pass down, or cycles, whether it's good or bad, cycles of dysfunction or, you know, cycles of um, sisterhood and solidarity that we then build on and, and kind of replicate. So for me, the camera was um, as an important symbol of, you know, the movement, what I want to contribute to the movement, um, what I hope, you know, we can all kind of collectively um, have a collective memory about that we can then pass on to those who come after us and that we can kind of reclaim our heritage and understand our her stories. Thank you. Um, that's so prescient and true about um, like memory, place, mood, all of those things being reflected um, and captured by a camera. I feel like that's a really, really symbolical object um, that you've brought. And also in terms of, you know, I, when I think about the Black feminist movement and the Pan-African feminist movement, um, so much of the, the insight actually, like the real bona fide knowledge that comes to it for me is, is through images, you know, like you see these images of um, Angela Davis and um, some African women, I can't think of who now, but I've seen like pictures of people connecting across the diaspora because Angela, Angela Davis, as an example, was traveling around the world, um, connecting with people and how, how strongly we need those images, um, especially in a world where the, the kind of written material of black women has been uh, made invisible and silenced so often. Thank you for that. Um, I would now like to, to pass on to, um, to Jamila, please. Can you share what you brought with us? Um, well, first of all, again, I'm very glad to be here and I would like to congratulate Africa Center for this event and Mina Salami for being the curator of this event. And now I have the opportunity to meet uh, such powerful, inspiring women and their work. So for me, it's, it's very, I'm very happy to have this, this opportunity to exchange knowledge and to know each other. Uh, well, I was raised in the Candomblé religion here in Brazil, Candomblé, which is an African Brazilian religion. Um, I was initiated in Candomblé when I was 80 years old, when I was a little child. And it was, at the same time, it was very important to me, it was very hard because Candomblé, it's a very discriminated religion in Brazil, marginalized it. And it was very difficult to be a black girl in school, in school using all the symbols of that religion. It was very difficult to deal with the discrimination. And for a long time in my life, I had difficult to accept the religion. So I was there because of my mom obligated me and my brothers and sister. But at the same time, it was very difficult to deal um, with this, um, you know, with this letter of blackness in Brazil. Uh, so during a long time in my life, I had these mixed feelings with the religion. And when my mother passed away, I, I took a long time apart of the religion. I came back when I was 30 years old, maybe. And then for me, it was a different connection with my religion. And, and Inhansan, Oya, in Brazil, you call Oya as Inhansan as well. I am, I am daughter of Oxóssi with Oya. So Oya, she's part of me. So 
I don't have an object that make me remember her because I feel part of Oya as I initiated the woman. And Oya is also my Odu. Um, she is the, the honor of my way. She, the, the number nine is the number that we, 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 we made the account of our birthday day. And nine is the number that symbolize Oya. So I feel very connected with this Orisha. And um, although I don't have any specific object that reminds me because I feel part of Oya, I wrote uh, uh, an article last year in honor of Oya in the Folha de São Paulo newspaper. And I would like your permission to read some parts. Yes. So, there are many stories told through the generations about Inyansa or Oya, the Orisha who owns the storms. These stories are known as Ethans in the Yoruba matrix. And through them, we discover more about our ancestors and we can investigate more about ourselves. Oya emanates a vital energy that can be either the flock of butterflies or a herd of buffaloes. It is that woman of fire, of fire who, with her akarajes, the first of them always is reserved for Ishu, the first Orisha, blessed trays and women who, with pride, dignity, and independence, raised their children and lead projects. When she passed, Oya, she is not overlooked. We are drips red in the market. She leads arms and she is a mother. She embodies a new possibility of motherhood, a different motherhood from the moral, uh, from the colonial moral. Her motherhood is one that, as I turn tells, leaves her children at home and goes out into the world to earn a living. Her children are left with two buffalo horns and the guidance that if they feel in danger, just hit one horn on the other and she comes at the speed of a hurricane. So ask permission from my ancestor, I write this, this, this article above all uh, to inspire women who pulsate vital energy. Um, Inyansa Oya has a moral defiance of racist patriarchal logic, logic, which confers on women the bondage and the motherhood in a romantic perspective. She, def she, she refused this romantic uh, view on motherhood. The construction of women as those who are at the service of men, this bourgeois, bourgeois construction that universalizes women. Uh, black women in Brazil in general, uh, unlike white women, have always worked and supported their homes, an obligation of the colonial situation that confined, confined them to a domestic work while black men were unemployed. Oya held the hands of many of us to move on. Currently, there is an ongoing movement that requires a plurality of companies and institutions opening paths with which to many of us were completely closed. We know that it is still an incipient movement given the high unemployment in the country and the rate of precarious jobs, which affect every vulnerable social group with proportional impacts to the avenues of oppression that cross, a, cross an identity. As a base of society, Black women are most affected by the authority policies and, they, and see their gains smaller compared to those of other social groups being reached. In this precarious scenario, women who boil like Inyansan deal with boycotts, 
delegitimation and the erasure and the erasure of humanity. In Brazil, how many raised children and grandchildren while men left home without given given the smallest care? So I speak in honor of these women. I urge them in solidarity to follow with dignity, um, freed from the feeling of grand, grand, guardianship by men who think they are not as successful as they deserve it, as well as resistant to the external temptation to become small, to fit certain expectation other than they are, their own. I dedicate to this, I dedicate with wishes that they will that they will always continue in the process of freeing themselves from guilty because they are not the perfect mothers who are in all school meetings or nor do they spend years watching only children programs just because the children the child cries i dedicate in particular to women who honor ancestral ancestral women's secret societies and organize themselves against domestic violence, rapes, and child sexual abuse, who dedicate themselves to the resistance support networks in this country. I want strength, but also I want the right to cry and above all, the right to humanity. And I think that OIA inspires us to, to feel um, this humanity, to go to the search of this humanity. So OIA for me, uh, although is my orisha too, I think it's these women that is the uh, this orisha who inspires these women that are working, that you are in the labor, that you are fighting for the transformations of the society. So this is a part of the test that I wrote last year about Oya, and for me, Oya symbolizes this especially in Brazil, this black woman who had to go to work, who had to protect their family, who had to, to, to refuse um, this non-place, this place that colonial view put us, this place only the place of the strength or only the place of the vulnerability. I think this is uh, where you confront this colonial view of the or, the, this logic of the or, or you are this or you are that. Oya show us that you can be this and that. I think this logic of the end, it's very powerful and Oya embodies that in these black women in Brazil who are trying to survive. Wow, that's such a powerful essay. Um, Please share it in the, or where people can find it if you don't have a direct link, um, because I know a lot of people listening will, will want to have access to it. Um, yeah, she's, uh, she kind of embodies or represents something that is both like radically compassionate as well as in radical resistance. And that was why I really wanted to, to bring that spirit into this conversation. So it's, it's amazing that she also happens to be your Orisha, or one of them anyway. Um, for, for people who are, are listening, um, you know, if you, you can read a lot about Oya online and generally sort of African deities, goddesses. Um, I just want to say one thing that it is, um, you know, you can read them either as sort of a means of spirituality, but they're also really archetypal um, and symbolical. So in the way that uh, Western Euro patriarchal knowledge system usually draws from like the Greek legends and ancient Greek myths. Um, I really see the Yoruba pantheon of gods as well as other African pantheons of gods as they have migrated into the diaspora as, as resources for us, both in terms of uh, fostering joy and fostering resistance. So that was really beautiful to listen to. Also, just to mention that I did ask speakers to bring an object, but um, it, it was said that the object could also be a poem or a reading. Um, so Jamila has very much followed the brief on that. Um, Timaine, did you bring an object uh, or 
Wow, wow, wow. Somehow I knew that you would come to me next. <laughs> well, there's only two people there. <laughs> I know, but I, I knew that it would be me because um, I changed my object five minutes before the event started. I had a poem before and it just, it came to me that I had to change the object. And as I explain what the object is, I think it will become clear why I knew I was going next. So these, um, I don't know if everyone can see them. These are arm cuffs that I have worn almost every day for the last decade. And they were just, they were originally, I thought just a random gift from the person I was seeing before I realized I had no desire to be anything but a lesbian. Um, and he had got me these arm cuffs rather randomly. And I just, I thought they were cute, so I put them on. And then I went to Ake Festival and I was stopped by a woman who I later found out was a priestess. And she said, oh, so you are an Austrian devotee. And I was like, I don't, what, what does that mean? And she said, but you are. And I said, no, no, I'm not. I was raised in a Christian household. I don't know anything about that. Fast forward to 2016. This had happened maybe three years prior, 2016. I had the experience that cemented my entire black feminist journey. And I had that experience across three cities on two continents. One of those cities was Bahia in Brazil. So I had gone, I had been invited to Accra to speak about spirituality and women's rights and women's survival in a world that tries to kill us. And then after that panel, I went on what I thought was a random visit to the Oshogo Grove. And then two days after that, I went to Brazil for a Black Feminist Conference. And the theme that ran through these three events was really just a metaphysical understanding that being a Black feminist wasn't just about political liberation, but it was about women's lives, Black women's lives in a way that goes deeper than just the, the systems that we are resisting. So if we are to really live in this world, we have to go into our lineage, into the places we have been, into the lives that our ancestors have lived, into the wisdom that has been handed down from generation to generation. And then we have to go wide as well. We have to go deep into community. We have to be able to reach out and touch the sisters that we want to stand in solidarity with. And we have to be able to do that in love. And all of these things are things that sort of came to me very slowly, but very inescapably over the course of these three days. And each time I would be reminded about these cuffs because someone would make what seemed to be a throwaway comment and they would be like, oh, I said it because of that. And I just say, but what is it that's so special about these cuffs? I found out later that apparently um, if you are an Oshun devotee or an Oya devotee, you wear cuffs like this to indicate that you have some sort of power that transcends this world, which explains so much of why I would be in markets and instead of getting sexually harassed as women generally tend to do, men would actually like circle away and just be looking at me. And I, I didn't know that this is what I had been carrying or wearing for years until, <laughs> until I think 2016, right? And the morning that I finally accepted that I, I needed to understand Black feminism, not just as a political movement, but as a spiritual commitment to Black women's lives and Black women's thriving and Black women's wholeness in a world that refuses to see us or refuses to make space for us. I was standing in a room and somebody was singing the song. I, it just, it came to me, it was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, hey, that's all I remember from the song, but it, it came to me and I just thought, wow, okay, I'm going to say the thing because clearly this is the thing that I'm supposed to bring to this conversation. So for me, this object represents the borderlessness of our freedom, right? There are so many people who do not 
understand the value of the Black feminist movement or the offerings that it has given to the world or all the ways that it has transformed the world so that everybody is more free. But for me, this object is a reminder that our freedom transcends time and space and any limitations that exist in this world. And that the spirit of Black feminism is a spirit that is committed to life, is committed to healing, is committed to love, is committed to community and growth and progress in an inclusive way. And I know that so much of the language has been co-opted by corporations and like feminism light, but if you go back to the spirit of what it is, if you go back to the wisdom that has been handed down and the wisdom that is generated when we are in community with one another, then really these things stop being buzzwords and they, they start meaning what they actually mean, which is that every human being matters. No human being is disposable, regardless of what the systems that we operate within might want to insist about our lives. Our lives are infinitely precious. And that is never and can never be limited by systems that are as flimsy as these man-made structures that we are railing against, right? They, they're so young, these systems, but our wisdom <laughs> has existed for millennia. It's it, like in your book, talking about the symbolism and the meaning of the color blue, right? Mina's book, Sensuous Knowledge, if you haven't read that book, what are you doing? <laughs> Go read the book, right? So our, our wisdom and our understanding of the purpose and the value of life transcends even the labels that we put on our movements today. So what we understand as Black feminism today is an ethos of love and an ethos of life that we nurture amongst one another because we know that this is what we deserve, because we know that we are precious, right? So I brought this just because that's the thing that I had to bring um, to remind myself that the work of Black feminism, the spirit of Black feminism is in transforming our understanding of who we are in the world so that we can transform how we are with one another, how we are in community, how we dis define what we desire even, because that's another thing that I, I think doesn't get discussed enough how when you really commit to the work of Black feminist solidarity, Black feminist community, even the things that you want change because everything that we want is conditioned, every desire that we have until we question it is a result of conditioning. But once we start to commit to sisterhood and solidarity and freedom and love, then even those things start to change so that we can show up in the world in ways that are powerful beyond people's comprehension. And that's why they call us witches, no? <laughs> that's exactly why they call us witches. <laughs> yes. Wow, you said so many really beautiful, powerful things. I'm really glad that you changed your object. I'm sure the poem would have been great too, but um, that for me really, you know, it really hit, hit the spot, so to speak. Um, you know, desire is sociopolitical, absolutely. And what I love about those handcuffs is uh, many things, but I feel like there's so much you said that one could respond to, but the shape of them, that kind of, that almost O shape, um, that really speaks to so much of the other things you said, of the kind of cyclical, the continuing relationships of political sisterhood, of history, the past, present, and future. Um, so thank you for that. That was amazing. Um, we actually do have two more speakers now, and so I'm gonna reach out to Aja. Um, can you share what you thought? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, thank you so much. I want to be, first of all, just in, in gratitude and in immense gratitude to be on this call with you all. Um, I'm, I'm listening and I'm seeing myself in your stories and in the ways that you are sharing. And so I hope to be able to, for us to continue to grow and nurture our relationships with one another beyond this call. Um, so to, to be respectful of time because we wanna make sure all the women can speak. Um, I, I'm i gonna share a little something, I, a little snippet paragraph I prepared, but my object is not just one object. 
unfortunately. Um, that just would be un unrealistic. <laughs> so I'm gonna share a few books that have uh, meant a lot to me. The first one I'm gonna share is um, Piss Stained Stairs and the Monkey Man's Wares by Jane Cortez. So I encourage those who are listening to please look up Jane Cortez. Um, she's a powerful, incredible poet. The next book I would like to share is a, a, a collection of poems um, called Lyrical Campaigns by June Jordan, um, who is, I would not be who I am without this woman uh, in all literal senses. Um, the next book I would like to share is a book by uh, an elder who I had a great privilege of learning and listening and um, witnessing and, and being um, under their guidance and mentorship, which is uh, Entezaki Shange, who, and uh, this book is called Sassafras, Cyprus, and Indigo. And I would encourage you all to please uh, get this book as well. Uh, Black women, this is for you. These are women who wrote for you, thinking of you, dreaming you up. And so I want to encourage you all to find these books that you may find yourself in. Um, the next book I would like to share is today is Tony Cade Bambara's birthday. And so it is only right that we acknowledge the great queen, the, the salt eaters uh, is, a, is a powerful book that I think one should read and spend time with if you can find it. She also wrote a, an anthology, was the first of its kind called the Black Woman Anthology. That was uh, transformative for me. And um, I have one more book and I'm gonna read something from it. But before I do that, I'm gonna read the little paragraph I wrote, which is uh, each of these women have helped me to better see myself and create the language for the world around me. Books have helped uh, to me to explore my interior world and the revolutionary power of healing oneself for the sake of community trans and transformation. These women have taught me that solidarity is not simply about our shared struggles and oppressions, but our shared visions and dreams, the joys and the ways that we dream them up together. I didn't know how to choose just one book or one woman because I'm a composition of so many women who have poured into me. And all of these women are in conversation with one another, witnessing their craft, the way with words, their resolve and commitment to black people in the diaspora and the power of books to connect us across continents and cultures. This has transformed and armed me with the weapons that I need. The ways we have reached out to one another across borders, the psychic terrain through which we travel and transform. I see these books as love letters between us through ancestral lineage we connect and we continue to reach out to one another. The many stories and voices we inherit, um, who sits with us as we write and as we read, uh, learning that I've, I've had the privilege to learn through reading, that reading is a metaphor for our spiritual sensibilities. It is how we see, it is how we listen, and it is how we observe the nuance of living here together. The idea that we are the most oppressed the most uh, marginalized, the most neglected, the most unloved, right? That that narrative is a narrative that we, um, we rebuke, that we resist um, because we are truly the most free. And how we determine that freedom is what makes us free. It's our psychic commitment to the spiritual resonance. It's our embodied practice. It's us knowing about third world feminism and oppositional consciousness that we create and we exist and we know the truth about the oppressor. We know the truth about white supremacy. We know the truth about colonialism, that we are the only ones that see it for what it is, that can read a spirit and tell it from up and down, right and wrong. And so I've uh, gravitated towards the literature that liberates me. And the last book that I'll share, and I have to end with, uh, of course, this sister, Asada, who um, I, I could not be who I am without this book. And knowing um, that this, this woman was also uh, a poet and um, moved in the world as a revolutionary, as a poet, and with great reverence for the Maroons and the, and the, and the spirit of women who came from the Maroon communities. Um, and the fact that our sister is still, still escaping the hands 
of white supremacy, that she is the true uh, superhero um, of, of black people and has continued to, to, to throw colonialism for a, for, a, for a spin. So this last piece I'll just share here is a affirmation. She opens up the book. I believe in living. I believe in the spectrum of beta days and gamma people. I believe in sunshine and windmills and waterfalls, tricycles, rocking chairs. And I believe that seeds grow into sprouts and sprouts grow into trees. I believe in the magic of the hands and in the wisdom of the eyes. I believe in rain and tears and in the blood of infinity. I believe in life. And I've seen the death parade march through the torso of the earth, sculpting mud bodies in its path. I've seen the destruction of, di of the daylight and seen bloodthirsty maggots prayed to and saluted. I have seen the kind become the blind and the blind become the bind in one easy lesson. I have walked on cut glass. I have eaten crow and blunder bread and breathed the stench of indifference. I have been locked by the lawless, handcuffed by the haters, gagged by the greedy. And if I know anything at all, it's that a wall is just a wall and nothing more at all. It can be broken down. I believe in living. I believe in birth. I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire of truth. And I believe that a lost ship steered by tired, seasick sailors can still be guided to port, home to port. Um, and I'm gonna end with Sister Asada and I wanna say thank you. I also wanna, uh, I do wanna say thank you to those who are, who are not fluent in English, but are, that we are unfortunately forced to have to use this language to connect to one another. Um, but we know that there are other languages we're speaking to each other right now. So I leave you with that. I leave you with that love, the things that are nonverbal that we are, we can communicate. And um, hopefully these words resonated in the frequency of them, whether or not they, you could fully understand the translation. So thank you so much. Wow. Um, my goodness. I, I felt so much as you were speaking, reading, I could listen to you. Um, all day to all of you actually but um that poem was really strong and certainly resonated beyond the language of english so thanks for sharing that in fact you know it is the what we're what you're speaking what we're speaking and invoking is the language of freedom and that is what that poem was about and yes you know um black feminism in so many ways is is a is a kind of guiding compass to the fact that we are struggling for freedom um, in as much as we are struggling against oppression. It is freedom that is the number one thing. So thank you extremely much for that. And um, last but not least, Tonya, um, what have you brought along today? I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. And also thank you to, to the panelists, to the organizers. It's a sincere privilege to be here. Respectful of time, I'm gonna offer my object um, as both object and also answer to the questions that you posed. I've brought here the poem, poem about my rights by June Jordan, queer Jamaican American poet um, to, bring, to continue to bring ancestors into the space and I think it, for me, the poem is answer, it's object and it's also answer. Poem about my rights. Even tonight, and I need to take a walk and clear my head about this poem, about why I can't go out without changing my clothes, my shoes, my body posture, my gender identity, my age, my status as a woman alone in the evening, alone on the streets, alone not being the point, the point being that I can't do what I want to do with my own body because I am the wrong sex, the wrong age, the wrong skin. And suppose it was not here in the city, but down on the beach or far into the woods. And I wanted to go there by myself thinking about God or thinking about children or thinking about the world, all of it disclosed by the stars and the silence. I could not go and I could not think and I could not stay there alone as I need to be alone because I can't do what I want to do with my own body. And who in the hell set things up like this? And in France, they say, if the guy penetrates but does not ejaculate, then he did not rape me. 
And if after stabbing him, if after screams, if after begging the bastard, and even if after smashing a hammer to his head, if even after that, if he and his buddies fuck me after that, then I consented and there was no rape. Because finally you understand. Finally they fucked me over because I was wrong. I was wrong again to be me, being me where I was. Wrong to be who I am. Which is exactly like South Africa penetrating into Namibia, penetrating into Angola. And does that mean... And does that mean, I mean, how do you know if Pretoria ejaculates? What will the evidence look like? The proof of the monster jackboot ejaculation on Black land. And if after Namibia, and if after Angola, and if after Zimbabwe, and if after all of my kinsmen and women resist, even to self-immolation of the villages, and if after that we lose nevertheless, what will the big boys say? Will they, will they claim my consent? Do you follow me? We are the wrong people of the wrong skin on the wrong continent. And what in the hell is everybody being reasonable about? And according to the Times this week, back in 1966, the CIA de decided that, that they had this problem. And the problem was a man named Nkrumah. So they killed him. And before that, it was Patrice Lumumba. And before that, it was my father on the campus of my Ivy League school. And my father afraid to walk into the cafeteria because he said he was the wrong age, the wrong skin, the wrong gender identity, and he was paying my tuition. And before that, it was my father saying I was wrong, saying that I should have been a boy because he wanted one, a boy, and that I should have been lighter skinned and that I should have had straighter hair and that I should not be so boy crazy, but instead I should just be one, a boy. And before that, it was my mother pleading plastic surgery for my nose and braces for my teeth and telling me to let the books loose, to let them loose, in other words. And I am very familiar with the problems of the CIA and the problems of South Africa and the problems of Exxon Corporation and the problems of white America in general and the problems of the teachers and the preachers and the FBI and the social workers and my particular mom and dad. I am very familiar with the problems because the problems turn out to be me. I am the history of rape. I am the history of rejection of who I am. I am the history of the terrorized incarceration of myself. I am the history of battery assault and limitless armies against whatever I want to do with my mind and my body and my soul. And whether it's about walking out at night or whether it's about the love that I feel or whether it's about the sanctity of my vagina or the sanctity of my national boundaries or the sanctity of my leaders or the sanctity of each and every desire that I know from my personal and idiosyncratic and indisputably single and singular heart. I have been raped because I have been the wrong sex the wrong age, the wrong skin, the wrong nose, the wrong hair, the wrong need, the wrong dream, the wrong geographic, the wrong sartorial. I have been the meaning of rape. I have been the problem everyone seeks to eliminate by forced penetration with or without the evidence of slime. And, but let this be, uh, let this be unmistakable. This poem is not consent. I do not consent to my mother, to my father, to the teachers, to the FBI, to South Africa, to Bedford Stuy, to Park Avenue, to American Airlines, to the hard on idlers on the corners, to the sneaky creeps in cars. I am not wrong. Wrong is not my name. My name is my own, my own, my own. And I can't tell you who the hell set things up like this, but I can tell you that from now on, my resistance, my simple and daily and nightly self-determination may very well cost you your life. Wow, thank you. Um, I actually missed who the poem was by. In the beginning. So June Jordan, you, um, Ajit, you can show the, the book that you should hear from her as it's well. It's from that same book. Um, yeah, please, at some point, um, anybody who bought books, um, please list them in the chat if you can, um, because I'm sure that, you know, after hearing these 
incredibly powerful and quite emotional readings. Um, the audience will want to get their hands, their hands on them. Um, that was just perfect um, in terms of, you know, the, the question, the object, it, it encapsulated everything that we've been talking about so far in a really poignant way. Um, so thanks for sharing that. And um, we had somebody, uh, one of our audience members, Deborah Ribeiro, shared something that I think is really beautiful. She said if um, she brought an object, it would be in nature and it would be the butterflies flying around. Um, so, you know, there's really so much uh, about freedom that's, that's coming through in this conversation about freedom as a, uh, something that we continue to, to strive for. Um, thank you for uh, hosting those, Aja. And we don't have lots of time left. So, and I really would like the opportunity for, um, for all of you to speak to each other, as well as to engage a bit with the audience. So I know I had, um, I prepared a, a second question, but um, I think I'm just gonna incorporate that as we like, just let's just, you know, talk. And, um, but part of that question was uh, speaking to some of the biggest challenges, as well as the biggest hopes that you feel represent the black feminist movement in your country or your region. And so, you know, ask each other questions if you have any, but maybe also briefly share that with us because I think that's something that, you know, when we leave uh, this event, this gathering tonight to have a feeling of, um, I want us all to have a feeling of uh, something that's really big in the part of the world that you live in. Um, and something that is also, I mean, something that's big and challenging and also in positive, in a positive sense. Um, I'm gonna kick us off with a question from uh, Charlene Green, who's been listening to this conversation. Um, and that might also spark, uh, take us back to, to what I just spoke about. So Charlene asks, um, what gap do you think exists in the black feminist movement? I'm adding that. Um, that can be interesting for future research. So what gap do you think exists in, in Black feminism that can be interesting for future research? Um, you can respond to that, or if any of you would like to ask anyone else of you uh, in particular, or more generally would like to ask, ask a question, then um, please go ahead and do that. I might try and answer the question and just thank you everyone for those um presentations it's you know it's really been just absolutely amazing and i really feel like it's some sort of old school deep black feminism here it's just incredible but that leads on to um getting into that question about the gap and um you know i feel like sometimes a lot of our sort of activism has been become very sort of focused on online discourse and there's a space for that but I think this this space that we've created here is a demonstration of the gap that has been missing that we need to sort of return to and you know get into that sort of consciousness raising space where it's not just the sort of political but it's also the emotional and the spiritual because that is the heart of of black feminism um, so some of the stuff that's happening in the UK, I don't want to go on it too much because I don't want to be like the British person talking about Britain and all the imperious nonsense that we, we do here. But um, obviously we've got a Tory government, um, a lot of people are doing stuff around this new bill that's coming in, which um, will have people imprisoned for 10 years if they damage statues. So we're facing this kind of culture war, which has been framed as a kind of anti-woke war by our government. So we're seeing increased censorship and that censorship obviously um, targets a lot of black women in particular because we are the ones that are often doing the most challenging work to the status quo and um, obviously the pandemic. And then after that as well, um, you know, employment, the gig economy, which most black women are on short term contracts. So those are the sort of things that I'm really interested in to um, bringing in back into black feminist spaces where we actually really start to sort of talk about how are we going to change some of these structures 
either through legislation, either through revolution, or, you know, just getting that back onto the table. And so that's what the work that I'm focused on doing here. Thanks, Jardine. Um, Tonya. I, yeah, could I jump in here? Thank you. Thank you as well, Jardine. So this question on gaps in Black feminist movement and also thinking about that in relation to research. For me, I was reflecting recently that I'm from a region where less than 10% of the population actually access ter tertiary education. So just if, if I'm starting on the, the research angle, there's a way in which the majority of the knowledge that we need to help us to think ourselves through these crises that we are experiencing are, you know, is actually excluded, invalidated. We don't have access to it. And so for me, thinking about gaps in Black feminist movement and Black feminist thinking, I feel like we have not even scratched the surface until we are able to value the knowledge, the not just the ancestral knowledge, but the fact that you know we need to be supporting the brilliance and genius of everybody and not have things that should be public goods be something that is only um, accessed by a very, very, very small minority. So I start there with that. But at the same time, I feel, you know, Black feminist knowledge is also sacred text. And we haven't yet begun to mine those sacred texts. We need spaces where we are sitting and teaching each other, learning from each other, learning particularly from the women who are organizing in their communities and in their spaces. And to, to just think lastly about this question of movements and of gaps is that we have to confront the ways in which our movements have also been exclusionary and have also in, oftentimes have moved away from seeking solidarity with the women who are most experiencing intersectional harm to build in, to a sort of like building relationships that are a lot more upwardly mobile because we think that the points of intervention have to be policy or have to be law. And that when that overtakes the work, it means that we are we, we lose so much knowledge, but we lose so many opportunities for solidarity, for community, for building with those who are facing intersectional harm. And just lastly, that question about the key issues that are facing you. For me, I I, I you know after Sylvia Winter, I think about what she she says. You know the 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 issue is the, the issue of man, the issue of this singular way of being human. Um, overrepresenting itself as though it is the human itself. And that so the climate issues that the Caribbean is on the front line of, on the shorelines of, you have parts of the region um, battered annually by storms. The, the economic issues that we are facing and the entire global economic crisis in relation to the pandemic, that all of these are stemming really from that singular way of being human that wants to to sort of relegate the rest of us to sub or lesser versions of the human and that that is what we must resist and refuse to be i'll stop here thank you um nabila um yeah. would you okay. want to respond to the question oh sorry jamila you i'll come back to you if, if nabila did want to to um speak to this question. No, I was going to say that I totally agree with Tonya and I think uh, to focus on the editorial project because I, I lead the editorial project here in Brazil, uh, I think it's so important to translate what women in the global south are producing because the um, translation politics are also colonial politics and here in Brazil, there are a lot of great women, the Latin American in general, uh, that people don't know. Uh, women who are writing um, and publishing books in a, in a facing, confront a very difficult reality here, and usually you don't know. Even in Brazil, uh, most of the people look up to the global north. And here in Brazil, Latin America, and South America, there are a lot of movements 
to refuse this idea, this um, uh, to confront this dependence of the, nor the global north in terms of epistemology. So how it's important to, to share knowledge, how it's important to us to know, of course, Angela Davis, who is amazing, and Patricia Hill Collins, but it's, it would be amazing as well if people knew Lelia Gonzalez, Sueli Carneiro. So I think it's very important to, to share uh, knowledge at exchange, just translations. And because usually here in Brazil, we as black women, as black feminists, we um, organize ourselves to translate women from different countries. And I think it's important from these women, especially women who are in the global north, to do the same with us. Because especially Brazil, people only see Brazil from the perspective of the absence, the perspective of the, you know, exotification. And here in Brazil, there are a lot of people doing great work and it's very difficult to publish. Um, in this project that I run here in Brazil, we have some translations in French, Italian, and Spanish. Um, and English, it's very difficult to, to have English proposals. So, but here we are translating the women from the United States. So we need this movement, you know, to spread the ideas from these epistemologies from the global South. I think it's very important and I think it's fundamental to, you know, to, to when you think about solidarity, when you think about um, transnational struggle, it's very difficult to produce in Portuguese because we speak a Brazilian Portuguese. Only in Brazil we speak this Portuguese because it's not the Portuguese from Portugal. And to learn another language, in Brazil, it's difficult. Only people who can pay can learn. So I think it's important to extend that and to publish what women from the global south is doing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to quickly uh, add my two pennies worth and say that you know we've we've seen so many incredible books throughout this conversation, and we're talking about books right now, and they're really important in terms of the translating. Um, from the, the Global South, as Jamila just spoke to. Um, but I want to also acknowledge that even like reading and literature and books in themselves can have a kind of class element to them. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, uh, I'm a big proponent of thinking of ep the epistemological um, beyond, uh, you know, the intellect. And, and that was partly why uh, you know, bringing objects as a way to disseminate knowledge felt really um, important here. Uh, there's another theme that has been coming through throughout the conversation, actually, and that's something that Shardine spoke about in the very beginning, which is the kind of, uh, I guess, the, the hegemony of the U.S. Um, that means that even when Black people are the kind of underdogs in the hegemony, their work still gets more attention in this in this um, big space, this framing that is black feminism. Um, and so I really appreciate that, that that has come up in terms of translation as well. Um, yeah, if, I'll, I'll just let you um, speak. I, I just wanted to say to Jamila, to Jamila, I would love to um, be in conversation with you about the project that we're working on right now, Voices um, with V-Day, the, the way that we did the project was, which is I was commissioned to write a new play to be the center of the movement work that we're doing. So the Vagina Monologues was a play that was created and every four, February 14th, women all over the world performed that play to raise awareness of, against sexual assault and, and violence. And so there's a new play that I'm creating that's going to be um, centering black women's, well, I hate saying centering, but grounded in black women's stories um, and I think that one of the things we learned while doing this work, because I had to do a call for submissions from women all over the world, was like being on the phone with, you know, women from Brazil or Zoom calls and trying to figure out translations. And I think the that's why I said in, in the beginning, like, I'm so grateful that we can try to communicate with this language, but there's so much that we can't. So 
Um, I would love to be a part of helping to find a way to, to translate um, and putting resources behind translating, um, you know, women to to women's stories. That's a big part of something that we witnessed when we sent the translation of the submissions, the call for submissions was women from Brazil being like, thank you for working on a translation because even this is so difficult. People do not think about that with when they do flyers, when they do a bunch of other materials. So I think a big part of our lesson is how are we, how are we making sure that translation is a part of our organizing, um, that it, it, every organization should have translators. There should be people who can communicate and di to, in, to different communities from different languages. And um, there's just a, a few things I wanted to share while learning from women around the world and listening to women around the world in the past six months has taught me is that one, the planet and the environment is one of our biggest struggles. Um, the way that black women are and African and indigenous women are on the front lines of environmental uh, injustice um, is, is a grave thing. The ways that, that the environment is be affecting um, farming and land and the relationship to land, um, sexual uh, te terrorism, and the, the fighting over land and how women's bodies become the front lines of that. That's been something that women have been sharing as being a huge issue um, within the last forever, but for sure within the last year, there's a lot of conversations about environmental um, impact, the pandemic, um, the ways, I mean, we, we're on a call, we're on a Zoom call and this is great being able to connect. There's beautiful things that have happened about the pandemic that have grown us and forced us to reach out to each other. But the pandemic has also led to a rise in, in domestic violence and um, assault, not just on the mothers and the women, but the children. And so there, there's a, a huge issue that we're facing around that and getting women's stories um, told and also resources for women to have their own housing and their own um, you know, access to, to healthcare. The last thing that I wanna say that kind of speaks to the US hegemony is um, you know, our social movements, black feminism is being co-opted. You know, it's very clear that that is happening in the States. <laughs> um, and that, you know, a big part of what we have to do is to decenter the center, right? So we keep talking about we're centering these people, we're centering these voices, but how do we fuck up the whole center? You know, just rearrange what we see as a center or centering um, and, and resist certain no words like marginal or oppressed. You know, how do we be conscientious of the language that is reinforcing this narrative that somehow we are the minority and somehow we are the ones that are the victims when white supremacy is its own victim. You know, like those who embody white supremacy are the real victims, um, are the real, you know, psych psychotic folks, okay? So pushing back on, um, on the notion that the most marginalized also is the metric of one's proximity to solutions or truth telling. That's another thing we've noticed in our movements that we often say, well, the most hurt, the most left out, the most oppressed person in this conversation is the one that ends the conversation is the person that, that speaks to everything. And learning that in many times and in many ways to the point that was shared earlier, our politics have to be rooted in healing practices. And what are the ways that we're transforming the language to show up in healing because people are, um, sometimes our suffering is the only way we, we identify, that we have to find out who are we outside of our suffering? What visions do we have when we imagine ourselves in ways that are different from our suffering? So that's something else I would love to learn about from you all. I have a question about um, what are the ways that you see identity expanding conversations and what are the ways that you see identity sometimes limiting the conversation? What are some of the challenges because what I learned in the continent is that some, some ways, the ways that we identify in the States can't be translated uh, in the same, it can't be talked about in the same way on the continent. So having to really grow our, our ideas around identity, what are some of the ways that you all are, are struggling with identity politics? And what are some of the ways that it's uh, expanded your work? 
that's a fantastic question. I think um, you know we can we can use that to kind of wrap up. We don't, we only have a few minutes left. Um, Timaine and Nabila, I'd, I'd love to include your voices in the second segment as well. So um, you know, speak to the the previous question, but also if identity is something that you'd like to address, then then do that because that's really powerful. Oh, absolutely. Um... The comment about the ways that identity really limits the conversation is very topical for me right now because I am in a place where I'm witnessing the young feminist movement in Nigeria really get caught up in, in the politics of the things it claims to resist, right? So young feminists who are cisgender and heterosexual are very invested in a narrative of feminism as cis women first, cis women only, right? And it pains me to see this happening because the only way that it can happen is if we prioritize embodied identity over political knowledge or political education. Anybody who's engaging with patriarchy as a system of oppression will understand that you cannot have an effective response to patriarchy that is cis women first, cis women only. That's, it's, it's a hydra headed monster and all of the heads will come for you at varying speeds, but they will come for you. If you cut off only one head, what are you doing? So this question about people being really limited by their understanding of identity or the material value of identity where feminists can boldly define themselves as homophobic and transphobic as part of their feminist politic is so baffling to me. And it's one of the things that I was going to share as a, a point of real despair for me because I, I have come up along with these people in my feminist consciousness and I feel like I just there is so little hope left when even people who identify as feminists are allowing themselves to be aligned with, with the state and with religious fundamentalists to oppress people who are LGBTQ plus or who are differently targeted by patriarchy. And we really just need to expand the conversation beyond identity because we need to start thinking about systems and outsmarting systems and our living systems and dismantling systems, instead of thinking about our politics as being defined solely and exclusively by the kinds of bodies that people assume that we have. That's for, for, for me being in the region, being in the West African region and seeing this happening with Nigerian feminists, with Ghanaian feminists, really with feminists in Anglophone West Africa on an immense scale, it's something that's extremely concerning to me. And I hope that as queer, black, intersectional feminists continue to expand our work beyond identity, that we will be able to shift the tide in a less regressive direction. Maybe if I can come in here, um, based on the conversation that we've been having about identity and what's been going on in the region, um, you know, as, as many of you know, we've had a war uh, in this country for the past couple of months, uh, past few months, actually. And I think, you know, one of the things that you're saying, but in a different context uh, to him is, you know, and, and the, the language that was used to justify the war, you know, it's not even called a war, it's called a law and order operation, you know, and that kind of galvanizes support. Um, and... And you know the increasing polarization that you see in the society. Um, it, it's it's scary in the sense that you feel um, you know the othering, and it's become so apparent. Um, and even the people that you think you know they're level-headed, they're sound, you know they, they would advocate for certain things, but you feel like they support this war. And you know it's mind-boggling to say you know what good comes out of war. You know what is it that we can gain from war? Um, where women's bodies become disposable um, along with men and lives and, and dreams and hopes and aspirations and all of that um, and the fragmentation of a country. Um, but, you know, in all of that, and I think to answer your question, Nina, about, you know, what, 
what makes you less hopeful is sometimes I see the conversations that are happening and I feel like, where's the love? You know, where, where do we see each other's humanities? Um, and I just point about, you know, the victim is actually the person who dehumanizes the other, right? When we dehumanize another, where it actually reflects more on our own humanity and our lack thereof. So how do we get back to the basics of love and you know, seeing each other as human beings um, and being kind and compassionate, perhaps first to ourselves, and then maybe if we're kind and we love ourselves and we can be loving and kind and compassionate to, our, to others. But I think this is something that's really been um, on my mind and, and kind of bothering me about, you know, where do we go from here? How, how is it so easy to, to insult and dehumanize and, and call each other out, you know, rather than you know, call each other in and, and kind of set set time and um, um, yeah, I think be kind. You know, like like give I don't know, give each other space. Um, maybe even to be wrong, but you know, like there's a there's there's redemption. There's there's something that you can come back to. There's there's love that you're feeling um, somehow, and you feel that people see you and they acknowledge your humanity, and then you know maybe we can move forward from there. Thank you, Nabila. Um, your calmness in conveying such a, a precious message feels like we couldn't ask for a better, better note to end on, um, and specifically to end on the topic of love, kindness. Um, you know, just just sort of opening space, um, which is what this conversation has very much felt to me like it's done. You know, it's really opened so much space and we need you know another we need like a week of just getting together either virtually but ideally in person to talk about love and kindness and compassion but also about uh trans women's rights and cis women and uh, hegemonies and forms of epistemology um, and there's just so much that we've covered today that we could talk about and need to talk about for a lot longer and you know i really hope that this has just been a seed um, through which you know we will continue to, to communicate with each other those of us who are here those of us who've joined in in the audience and all of our networks um, we really need to do so much more of this um, i just want to also share with all of the speakers that i've been getting um, i've been looking at the comments and also getting private comments um, the people just saying how deeply this conversation has affected them. Um, and I'm not surprised at all because it's done that for me. It's just been um, so beautiful. But I also sense that, you know, there's a, there's a real sort of critical probing that we're doing. And I feel that black feminism is really at a cusp right now. And it's up to us where we go from here and how relevant, I mean, we'll always be relevant, but how much we're going to shape uh, the, the future, the 21st century, and I think we, we are going to shape it. Um, we have to shape it, basically. Um, so I want to thank each of you um, from deep down in my heart for joining, for giving this so much beauty, so much resistance, so much spirit. Um, I couldn't appreciate it more. Um, I also want to thank the Africa Center with whom I've worked to put this together. You've been great. Um, Alana and Hinon, you've just been the best team to work with. Um, and thank you to everybody who's joined us from around the world. Um, make sure to follow the Africa Center. Um, that's the actual handle at the Africa Center. Um, you can follow me at Ms. Afropolitan online. Um, I'm gonna ask all of the speakers to, to, to just put in the chat box if you have a social media handle where people can find out more about you and your work or a website. Um, wherever they can find more information about you. Um, and I want to just end with um, the object that I brought um, for Oya, um, except for wearing red, which is her color. Um, but I also brought a poem, it's really short. It's, uh, it's a praise poem to Oya that I read in a book by Judith Gleason. Um, and it goes, praise to Oya, great godmotheress of the wind of change and the leader of freedom for women who unfreely praise the broken earth. And I love that praise poem because, um, you know, it, it, it really speaks 
to the endurance of Black feminism over the ages and over the regions. And here we are today, um, further, further furthering that message. So thanks again, everyone, and I'll see you soon. Bye. We don't want to leave. We're still here, yes. <laughs> Everybody's doing it. Just like, do I have to go? Oh, mine was just Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I'm now getting off the journey. The Africa Center's mission is to help reframe um, and to provide new narratives about the continent of Africa through art, through culture, through policy, through business. These different sort of uh, pillars of who we are, just really providing new information, new stories to the community. We're really trying to build a very strong, robust community of people who will then take the stories that we, we put together here, who bring their own stories in here, and then take them out to the rest of New York City and, of course, the wider world. This book is my way of saying we've gone through similar things. To different degrees, yes. There, there is a connection. We are the same people and I'm apologizing and I know other people do it too and we can start talking. Quite often I hear today that, oh, you can't teach children how to read music. It's far too difficult. But of course, that's an adult thing. Um, ch children can learn to do anything and, and that's one of the reasons why Music is so important for everybody because of the cognitive development for every single person. The unique contribution of the Africa Centre at this time in this country is to remind us of one very powerful thing. The world is becoming more unequal, the world is becoming more divided. And yet, as I look out from the Africa Centre, all I see are children of Africa. We are all sons and daughters of Africa, and it is Africa that can remind us of our common humanity, that no one can build a wall against, no one can deport. Our Africanness is what unites us, and that is a generosity, a hospitality, and a, and a humanity that this center aims to bring to this city and remind this great country of.